Hello and welcome to the Churches Together live stream. A very warm welcome to you. Uh, Wherever you are, uh, whenever you're streaming this, you are most welcome. Now it may surprise you to know this, but this is in fact the second to last live stream uh, we're going to be running as Churches Together in the Bovey Valley Mission community. It's been a wonderful couple of weeks and it's been a lot of hard work And later on in our service, we're going to be seeing some of the tech team who've been behind the scenes being involved in the children's activity song, uh, which we're all very much looking forward to. We're also going to be hearing from Sarah Margetts and this uh, morning's preacher, uh, Jack Knightley. Now, we do hope that these past couple of weeks have been an encouragement to you. But as we all know... Life is not always easy. In fact, life has been very hard for many of us over the past couple of weeks, and perhaps even this week in question. So as we come to this service, let's think about this. How has your week been? If, like me, you may not feel you've achieved very much this week or the past couple of weeks, Some of us have been on furlough and been unable to do any work. That's been very discouraging. Perhaps it's left you discouraged with the fact of possibly losing your job or seeing others lose their jobs too. There is one pressing issue though. We as the Lord's people are certainly not immune from trial. But there is always hope for those of us who trust in the Lord Jesus. I'm going to begin by reading some words from Matthew's Gospel. They're directed to the disciples, and by proxy, that means they're directed to us. Let me read it to you. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. There is a great encouragement there for those who trust in the Lord Jesus, despite our circumstances that we may find ourselves in. The Lord Jesus promises disciples that he will be with them until the very end, and that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Therefore, there is a great reason to take heart because the Jesus is in control of all situations that happen and he can be trusted with their outcome. It's not easy and the disciples will know this as they face deep persecution uh, from those inside and outside the Jewish tradition. But it is one we can take heart in. To begin our time together, let me say a prayer for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are an authority over all things, that the Lord Jesus is seated at your right hand. And as we come, listen to your word, worship you, please strengthen us by your Spirit that we may trust you in all situations. And through trusting you in all situations, may we make disciples of all nations. In the name of the Lord Jesus we ask. Amen. Now, sadly this week, we don't have any live music, as far as I know. But we do have plenty of canned music, and that is not uh, always a bad thing. So let us worship together in the words of our first hymn. Spirit of a virgin's fame To the anguish and the shame of scandal Came the Saviour of the human race But the skies were filled with the praise of hell Shepherds listen as the angels tell Of the gift of God Yeah. 
of a friend's betrayal He was lifted on a cruel cross He was punished for a world's transgressions He was suffering to save the lost He fights for breath He fights for me Losing sinners from the chains of Good morning everyone. Today is our final talk in our series about what is church. We've been learning about all the different ways the Bible describes church. Church is like a vine, church is like a family, a body, a lampstand, a bride, church is where we talk to God, church is where we hear from God. Church is described in many different ways in the Bible. Now today we are doing our final one, which is, church is really looking full now, all the different ways the Bible describes it, but church is, see that, forever. Now, the, the Bible talks about church being forever. Now what does it mean when we say that the church is forever? Now, Jesus gave his disciple John a dream to show him what the church in heaven would look like. He makes it sound like the Olympics. Here's a picture of the Olympic ceremony a few years ago. A huge party with people from all over the world having the best time possible. Listen to what they're enjoying the most. This is from the Bible. It says, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they crowd out, cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now it talks about people from every tribe and nation, from every country, from every language, of colour and of every accent. A wonderful international party, a bit like the Olympics. But what are they enjoying? It's better than athletics and sport. They are enjoying Jesus. They are around his throne and they are worshipping him. They are celebrating everything they know about Jesus and that he saves them. They are saying salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb who sits on the throne. Now I thought it would be fun to hear people from different languages saying that salvation belongs to our God. Now we're going to listen to some different people from different languages saying just that. Verlossing behoort aan ons God. Ju en shu yu wamanda shangdi 
La salvación es de Dios. Heil und Rettung kommt allein von unserem Gott. Did you recognize the languages spoken? Did you know that there are over 7,000 languages in the world? I didn't know that. I had to look that up. That is a lot of different languages. And there are going to be people from every language and every tribe praising God in heaven. It's like this cake. As we gather together today, we get just a taste of what it will be like in heaven. As we gather together and worship with other people, as we talk about Jesus and read about him in the Bible, we are tasting what it is going to be like in heaven. But when we get to heaven, we won't just have a taste, we will be able to enjoy a full slice of cake. We will be able to enjoy all that Jesus is about. We will be able to know him fully and be with him forever. We won't need the Bible to learn about Jesus because Jesus will be with us in person as well as everybody from the different nations of the world. I can't wait to be in heaven and to be able to worship together with so many different people from different places. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we will be able to worship fully in heaven, that there will be no more sickness and sadness and things to stop us fully knowing you. Lord, we pray that we would continue to look forward to heaven and to enjoying you forever. Amen. Now we're going to sing our children's song about heaven, where we sing that we have a home in heaven where God will be with us. And then after that, Steve Brown is going to read us our Bible reading. showed all these things to his disciple John Earth and skies and seas all gone and remade again in golden green and blue He is making all things new I've got a home in heaven and my soft grass beneath my toes I'll see my Lord and he will lead me through he is making all things new I've got a home in heaven and my Lord will be there too So no more pain, tears or sorrow, write this down, he says these words are true, he is making all things new. I've got a home in heaven, and my Lord. Amen. 
Thank you, Sarah, and all those that helped you. I hope us oldies also allowed the child within us to join in with you. The reading is from Acts chapter 10, verses 23 to 48. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and he had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Three days ago I was in my house, praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately. And it was good for you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God, listening to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realise how true it is that God does not show favouritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen. By us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter, Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptised with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Wow, what an experience that must have been. I wish I'd been there, don't you? And now I'll pass over to Jack. Thank you, Steve. Let me pray for us now as we begin. Heavenly Father, Please speak through me now as we open your word. Help us see how glorious Jesus is, that we would grow to be more like him by your Spirit's work in us. For your glory we pray. 
Amen. Who doesn't belong in church? Who, in your opinion, if they walked through the door of a, a physical church service, would make you raise an eyebrow and say, they shouldn't be here? Well, I'm hoping the answer to that question is nobody. But why? Is it just because Christians are supposed to be nice and welcoming? Because we want to boost our numbers? Or is there something deeper, more significant and more wonderful at play here? And do, do we really act like the answer uh, is, is nothing? Uh, nobody. It, it is one thing to say that, that we are welcoming churches and another thing altogether for everybody in the congregation to welcome anyone who walks through the door. If you've been joining us in recent weeks or months, uh, you'll know that we've been journeying through the book of Acts and we've been following the, the growth of the early church from Jesus sending out his disciples on the day he ascended into heaven and, and then taking the good news that he is alive and reigning to Jerusalem, uh, local Judea and neighbouring Samaria and beyond uh, to, to the ends of the earth, as Jesus puts it. And we have seen the good news be received by some interesting characters. Saul of Tarsus, uh, who had been locking up and persecuting a great number of Christians on account of his Jewish zeal. But now in Acts, Jesus is using that zeal for great good instead of evil. Simon the sorcerer, who though initially appeared to have given up his fame for uh, the fame of his work to, to serve Jesus, sadly proved to be just enthralled by the miracles and not the, the God who worked them. And also the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, in whom we see the ends of the earth starting to be uh, a part of God's plan. But that was just a glimpse, a single person. How, how does everyone else fit in? Can everyone else fit in? Almost every Jew in Jesus' day thought that non-Jews were unclean and, and not to be got within ten foot of uh, unless they themselves wished to be considered unclean. Surely the Lord God of heaven doesn't want all these unclean people in his family, does he? Well, friends, that's the, the beauty of our passage this morning. He does. He wants as many of us as possible, uh, no matter what our background is, no matter how unsuitable certain religious people might, might think we may be. Jesus has opened up salvation to every kind of person. And that's what we see in our chapter this morning. Uh, the two truths for us to take away today. God works in ways we don't expect, in people we don't expect. To bring them to hear the good news, believe and be baptised. Uh, but don't just uh, take my word for it. Uh, grab, grab a Bible if you haven't uh, already and turn to, uh, to Acts chapter 10. Uh, yeah, pause me here if you need time to flick to it. Our, our reading that Steve kindly read for us uh, started a bit abruptly. Um, the, the whole chapter probably would have been a bit too long. So we started with Peter inviting the guests into his house. Uh, and these guests were servants of a Roman centurion, Cornelius. Uh, who had had a vision from God telling him to send for Peter, and we aren't told why initially. And as the servants go on their way, Peter himself has a vision, a, a much stranger one, uh, involving a, a sheet descending from heaven, holding many animals, uh, which Peter is then commanded by God to eat. He objects uh, because some of the animals are ones that God has said in the, in the Old Testament law, were unclean. But God tells him that he should not call anything impure that God has made clean. Peter is perplexed about this, uh, but while he's thinking about it, uh, the guests arrive and God tells Peter to go with them without hesitation. The men explain why they are here uh, to ask him to go to Cornelius and Peter goes with them the next day. Cornelius explains his vision and Peter, now understanding the meaning of his vision, 
explains that God's salvation in Jesus is not just for Jews, but for all peoples of the earth. And the Holy Spirit is poured out on everyone who hears Peter's message and they're baptised. Now, that, that summary might have seemed fairly unremarkable to you, but I think that that is um, probably because most of us here in the Bovey Valley aren't Jews. Let's, let's try and put ourselves uh, in Peter's shoes back then. First off, uh, God gives him a vision of animals descending from heaven, uh, implying that they are acceptable in God's eyes. Uh, but some of them are the same uh, kinds of animals as ones described as unclean in Leviticus chapter 11. Perhaps there were pigs, uh, rabbits, eagles or, or chameleons in the collection of animals. And, and God, the, the voice from heaven, uh, tells Peter to, to eat them. But, but Peter knows his Bible and so he says, no way God, I've, I've never eaten anything that wasn't kosher. Perhaps he thinks it's some sort of test. But God replies um, by saying not to call unclean what he has made clean. And, and this happens three times. It, it would have been unthinkable for a Jew to eat a pig. Doing so would have ritually defiled themselves under God's law. But Peter should have remembered that Jesus himself had explained a year or two before in Mark chapter 7 what all this clean and unclean stuff in the Old Testament points to. Our hearts. You don't get defiled, Jesus says, but because of what you eat or other external factors. Being unclean is caused by having an unclean heart. Anyway, Peter thinks the animals are unclean and so he won't eat them. God says he's made them clean. And then some men arrive who are from the household of a Roman centurion. Yes, a, a decent and upright guy, we're told, but nevertheless, a Roman. Peter's Jewish instincts would say, don't have anything to do with them. But God told Peter, don't hesitate to go with these non-Jews. This, this is part of his plan. God works in ways we don't expect. If, if you had asked Peter uh, that morning if he'd be off to visit a, a Roman centurion anytime soon, he probably would have said, I don't think so. But that's just it. Sometimes, or even often, God's plan is completely not what we expect. Would anyone have expected God to send uh, the, the Christ, the promised rescuing king, to be born in humble circumstances? being very unpopular with the, the religious leaders of his day and be ex executed as a common criminal? I don't think so. God works in ways we don't expect. And this may be particularly applicable to, to your life right now. I, I know many of you, dear friends, are facing impending redundancy or, or fighting the after effects of this wretched virus. Uh, or, or struggling with poor mental health. And, and it would be okay to think, God, what are you doing? How can this possibly be a part of your plan? Well, please take heart that though these circumstances would not be how we would plan things, God is still at work in unexpected situations. Uh, he, he hasn't forgotten you. COVID-19 hasn't, hasn't caught God off guard. He, he hasn't dropped the ball. He is working for his people's good and his own glory, even if we can't see how. But that's not all we need to learn from this passage. God works in ways we don't expect, in people we don't expect. Peter found himself outside his, his comfort zone for Cornelius and his household's benefit. The, these Gentiles, these non-Jews, are the first to receive the Holy Spirit in verse 44. God is now moving in those who were outsiders, unable to be a part of God's people. But God made Cornelius clean. That's, that's what he does in the, in the hearts of, of everyone who believes in Jesus, through Jesus' blood shed on the cross. And so no Jewish believer 
ought now to think Cornelius unclean. And Peter knows that uh, he ought not to think someone can be unclean because of whether they are a Jew or not. Uh, That's what he says in verse 28. And he sums it up well in verse 34. God does not show favouritism. Jew or Gentile, salvation is open to all who come to Jesus. God isn't going to turn you away because of where you're from. It's been a part of his plan all along to include all nations in his people. In Genesis, the the, the covenant promises to to Abraham that all peoples will be blessed through his family line. In Isaiah, the Messiah is, is a light to the Gentiles. And in Revelation, John sees a multitude that no one can count from every tribe, tongue and nation before the throne of God. Our God is a God who brings in the outsider. Jesus saves Jew and Roman and and, and neither alike. And so, if we believe verse 34, our God does not show favouritism, then we shouldn't either. Now, most of us wouldn't have an issue with non-Jews being in our church families, primarily because most of us are non-Jews ourselves. But what other dividing lines do we tend to draw in our churches, perhaps even subconsciously, thinking certain types of people don't belong in church? Local drug dealers, prostitutes, other people our society tends to view as, as, as unclean. How how would you react, say, if if one of these people came to a church event and and sat two metres away from you? Would you be horrified or would you be rejoicing that God is working in the lives that you do not expect? And the same question could even be asked about uh, dividing lines drawn from from low-lying personal prejudices. Uh, Would you welcome a a black or Asian newcomer in your gathering in the same way as you would uh, a white newcomer? Or would you avoid speaking to them, thinking it couldn't possibly be part of God's plan that that, that they would settle at your majority white church? Whatever it may be, I suspect all of us, including myself, have some degree of pharisaical tendency in in showing favouritism to to people like ourselves. And it's probably natural, but it definitely isn't supernatural. God works in ways we don't expect in people we don't expect. To what end though? What is, what is the Lord's end game in his ways? Well, as we see in our passage, it is to bring them to hear the good news, believe and be baptised. Peter in verse 34 explains that God does not show favouritism, uh, but accepts people from all nations. And then he goes on to, to tell them the message of Jesus, uh, some of which they apparently already know. Um, that the Lord Jesus announced the good news of peace, being anointed with the Holy Spirit and by God's power, defeating the power of the devil. He was killed and was raised from the dead by God and was witnessed to be alive by many who ate and drank with him, uh, including Peter. Peter concludes by, by speaking of Jesus, commissioning his disciples to tell all that he is the one whom God has appointed judge of all and saviour to all who believe in him. Now this wouldn't have happened that day if God had not clearly worked to bring Peter and these Romans together to hear what Peter had to say. It was his plan for them to hear his message. But not just that. Look at verse uh, 44 with me, please. While Peter was still speaking these words, The Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. for They heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. God, the Holy Spirit, is poured out on these Gentiles. God begins to make his home in the hearts of non-Jews. And they are praising him and speaking in tongues having believed. Uh, They're they're now acknowledged as being just like Peter and the Jewish Christians who who came with him, which means that they need to be baptised as a sign of the cleansing that God has performed on their hearts. 
so we mustn't forget as as Christians when God does amazing things, bringing the most unexpected of people um, in in our own minds. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, bringing the most unexpected uh, person in our minds to us, or us to them, uh, seeking Jesus. That we actually give them Jesus. We mustn't forget that. We heard this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's no use when uh, God sets up the encounter for us to be silent. That encounter needs to be with the real Jesus. So let's give them the real Jesus, the real good news that he came, that he lived the perfect life that we humans were designed for, but, but can't live because of our sin. That he died to cleanse us from that sin and he rose and ascended to show eternal life is where his followers are headed. That is good news. That is what God wants everyone all over the world to hear. Jesus is Lord and Saviour. Hallelujah. And I'd just like to close by saying that um, I've been talking about a lot about what we in church need to be remembering and doing. Uh, but there's also another type of person who may be listening. The one who considers themselves the outsider. The one who may even think that church is, is not for them because of past experiences uh, or because of assumptions about God or Christians. Please, if that is you, know that God is working in your life uh, just from you tuning in this morning. He wants you in his family, no matter what your background is. Whether it's one of, of, of growing up in church, but now quietly keeping God at arm's length or publicly sticking two fingers up at him uh, for your entire life. Jesus has longer arms than you and he is ever forgiving. Let him embrace you and forgive you. You will be changed in unexpected, glorious ways. And God's church will be all the more rich to have a new unexpected person a part of it. I'll pray now before we have our next song. Loving Father, we thank you that you have a glorious plan to bring together all kinds of people in Jesus. Please help us to trust that plan when unexpected things happen. Also, please forgive us when we think too narrowly about your church and help us to root out our assumptions about whom you are interested in. Finally, Lord, for those listening who don't yet know the forgiveness Jesus offers, I thank you that uh, you know who they are and you care about their struggles. Please help them to see how good a God you are and find true welcome in Jesus and his people. Amen. We're now going to have our final song, uh, after which Eleanor will uh, lead us in further prayer. Uh, the song is uh, a hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West. Uh, we'll be singing it to the tune of Amazing Grace. And it's a hymn which uh, reminds us of the lack of favouritism with Jesus. Um, no barriers dividing his people. So let's live as one with unity in all things. In Christ, there is no East or West.
sisters praise his name who died to set us free from sin division hate and shame from spite and enmity Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you that we can come into your presence and lay our petitions and prayers before you. Thank you that you are a God who walks alongside us and travels through our lives, noting every detail, every thought, every moment, directing our steps as we journey. Thank you for the way you directed the paths of Cornelius and Peter in our Bible passage today. And so we turn to you in prayer, knowing that you are a God who directs pathways and lives. And so we pray. We pray for all the students who have received A-level results and GCSE results over the past few days. It's been such a time of great anguish and anxiety for many. And so we lift these young people to you now. Make their pathway, pathways clear and determine their steps into the future. In the middle of such muddle and confusion, may you plant your peace and calm into their lives. Lord, direct their paths. We pray for those affected by the closure of Heatree. And we mourn the loss of such a wonderful centre. So many lives and livelihoods have been turned upside down by this news. And we ask that you will comfort and console the people involved. You are our Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And we pray that you will provide solid and firm futures, jobs, finances, and most of all, provide your peace. Lord, direct their paths. The world continues to struggle against the battle of this pandemic. We watch our television screens and we see the continued sorrow, loss and anguish which this pandemic has dished out. We pray for continued wisdom for the leaders and governments as they seek to make balanced decisions. We continue to pray for the research and the hope of a vaccine and treatment soon. Lord, direct our paths. We pray for each of the churches in Bovey who have worked so hard to deliver live stream services week by week. We thank you for the blessing that this service has been to so many. And we pray for each church as they go into a different phase of providing church in these strange times and pray that your Holy Spirit will anoint each one for the tasks you have in store for them from September onwards. Lord, direct our paths. Lord, we bring before you those we know personally and love who are in need of your mercy, your healing and your love. And we name them before you in the silence now. Lord, Lord, direct their paths. We ask all these prayers in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, direct our paths. Amen. And we're now going to say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I'm now going to hand you back to Mark for the close of the service. Thank you. Well, I hope that's been an encouraging time for you as you've been watching the live stream, as you've been engaging with the music and as we've been feeding off God's words uh, from Jack. I'd just like to draw back to, uh, our minds back to something that we saw. In verse 34, Then Peter began to speak. I now realise how true it is that God does not show favouritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Of course, he's talking about all those who come to the Lord Jesus in faith are all welcome and as we do that we are brought into the family of God and that's the wonderful truth that despite meeting online or socially distanced perhaps in a physical service we are all united by the Lord Jesus and all part of his great community that is the nation of Jesus the kingdom of the Lord Jesus I thought it'd be good to finish our time together by saying a collect. A collect is a Church of England prayer set for every Sunday. And they wonderfully capture often uh, the great hope of the Christian. So let me pray this collect for us as we close. O oh God, you declare your almighty power most chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Mercifully grant to us such a measure of your grace that we, running the way of your commandments, may receive your gracious promises and be made partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.